good evening. It is Wednesday, December 6, 2017 at 7 o'clock. Welcome to the school committee meeting. Um, we are being recorded live for broadcast and for future rebroadcasting. Please come to your seat with the pledge. Tonight we have Sean Pellerin and Ashley Arnold here from the Douglas Middle School. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ashley Arnold, and I'm here with Sean Pellerin. We are student council members in grades 6 and 8. Today we are here to give an update on the middle school news. Thanksgiving break was a refreshing vacation from our busy school routine. We had three half days for parent-teacher conferences beforehand as well. Report cards were issued and available on IPASS, and now second trimester has started. The Snowflake Drive has just begun, and we hope to bring many presents for families in need this holiday season. On December 14th, the middle school band and chorus concert is being held at 6 o'clock p.m. They have work, been working extremely hard in preparation and are very excited to display, the, to display their accomplishments. December 20th is a very eventful day for our school. The sixth grade Tiger Bucks auction is scheduled to be held at, seventh, at the seventh grade and is going on a field trip. Tiger Bucks are amounts of credit logged by teachers to reward students for good behavior. The students will take part in using their Tiger Bucks to bid against each other for donated prizes. As well as the Tiger Bucks auction, on this day, the seventh grade will be going on a field trip. They're going to see a Christmas carol at the Hanover Theater in Worcester. This trip helps the students explore and compare literature and play a viewing, a viewing performance at first hand. A couple weeks ago, athletes tried out for the boys and girls JV and middle school basketball teams. Practices have started already and first games are approaching quickly. This basketball season looks promising for all the teams that have been chosen. Indoor track has just opened up to the 7th and 8th graders as well. This new opportunity has piqued a lot of interest and runners are beginning to practice. This last month has been a very productive. The start of the second trimester has marked a turning point for this school year and there are many bright things waiting in the near future. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Is there anybody in the audience? You guys can. You don't have to stay. Unless you want to join us, you can join you're us. Welcome but to you're, back you're welcome. You can go back to your seats. <laughs> Whichever you want. Hey, Ashley. I just, I just have to say, I remember when you were just like so little, and now you're like sitting here in middle school. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Too. Good job. Thank you. We'll open it up to public comment and communications if anybody has anything that they'd like to bring to us. Seeing none, um, we will move on to the accounts table report. <coughs> so, um, back on 11.2. Uh, uh, we had 14 um, batches of accounts payables um, that are reviewed, uh, totaling 328,000 um, and change. Most of that was from the general fund, about $187,000 uh, from the general fund, and another 117 um, from Circuit Breaker that made up 300,000 of, of the total 328 there. Um, all your details attached here uh, for review, uh, but found no issues with it. Mm -hmm. good. Very good, and I know that it's on the on the uh, consent agenda, um, the discussion about an alternate designated signer for the accounts payable warrants. Do you want to just have that discussion now? Sure. Um, is there anybody who's clamoring to be a <laughs> alternate signee in the, in the event that okay. Brett can't do me. it? I thought you were just looking at me. When when do they have to be signed by? What what are the days usually? And what time? Um, well, during it would be during the day, and typically it's on Thursdays. So um, after two, is that? 
Is that a sign that um, you need to make or that you need? I think that that could work. Because you work full time, Jamie works, so I can do it. That's yeah. fine. Okay. And it's just as an alternate, you know, yeah. whenever okay. it's not available. Yeah. Yeah. And they usually give you a couple days' notice to say mm -hmm. they're going to be ready. If they're on, ready. You know, Thursday. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Tuesday, Wednesday. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, okay. good. Yeah. Okay. So great. So Julie Finnegan will be the alternate. And then um, Julie also brought up a good point about all the backup. Um, perhaps that we can all get the, the top sheet of this, but maybe only make one copy of the backup for us to view at the table if anybody really wants to go through it. Otherwise, we're wasting so much yeah. paper. And ink. And ink. And ink. Yeah, no um, if anybody wants to go through it, it is still available to go through at Central Loft House. Does anybody have any issues with that? Nope. Okay. No issues. Very good. Thank you. Um, so that brings us into the meeting minutes from November 15th, 2017. Did anybody see any changes that needed to be made? I have any questions or comments on it? Seeing none, I'm looking for a motion to approve. I move to approve the meeting minutes of November 15th, 2017, as presented. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Very good. Thank you. Um, we have a letter to dispose of grounds equipment um, from Jeff Collette, the facilities manager, uh, where he's seeking school committee approval to dispose of a hedge trimmer. It's been determined that repair costs would exceed the cost to replace this unit. This trimmer has already been replaced. Um, the replacement cost was $299.95. Does anybody have any objections with disposing of the old one? So I'll be looking for a motion to approve. I move that we approve the disposal of the head trimmer. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thanks. Um, I'm going to turn the um, French River Education Center oil bid over to Mrs. Keegan, please. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the uh, Douglas Public Schools participates in the French River Education Center um, collaborative bid process um, among 18 school districts and three municipalities that participate in that. And we did have our um, bid opening on November 13th. There were five bids, and Santa Energy won the bid at 2.0611 per gallon. Prices range from um, the 2.0611 per gallon to the highest um, was 2.1559 per gallon. Um, and we did bid for our own school district for 91,000 gallons, um, I mean 85,000 gallons, sorry. Um, the estimated contract value is 175,193.50, and that's an increase over the FY18 of $7,844.50. So, um, you know, pretty good prices. I mean, compared to, we were a little bit aggravated, went up a little bit being business managers, but then we all reminded ourselves of a few years back when it jumped up to almost $4 a gallon, so we quieted down very quickly. <laughs> so <laughs> I stopped complaining. Um, Where are they out of? So. North Pole. Yeah, oh no. <laughs> that poor guy at the bid opening, I'll tell you, he had to listen to about an hour's worth of those kinds of jokes. <laughs> to be honest with you, um, He's from another state, but actually they have um, in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and among other places, but the oil will be coming from Bridgeport, Connecticut. That was one of the questions that we had for him. We want to make sure that we always ask, you know, how, how large is your facility? How many trucks do you have? We're so afraid of maybe not having enough trucks. How far away are you? Just make sure that we get the delivery. So he was grilled for over an hour, and then he had another hour of the Santa joke. So, you know. <laughs> um, okay. But anyway, so we will be looking for... Um, uh, a vote to ex approve it. So all the all the municipalities and school districts have to um, approve it before the contract is finalized. Does anyone have any questions? Nope. Move to accept Santa Energy's bid of 2.0611 per gallon for the purchase of number two fuel oil for fiscal year 2019, pursuant to the French River Education Center Inc. number two fuel oil invitation for bids. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Um, 
the licensing agreement between the Douglas Public Schools and the White and Community Center. Um, my question about this was, are we behind? Oh, yes, we are. We usually do this in um, June of the prior year. Okay. And then I realized when I went to send out the first invoice <laughs> that we hadn't signed the agreement. Okay. So there are not any changes. There are no changes to the agreement from the prior year. I did have um, Mrs. Social look at it just to make sure that there weren't any changes that does affect her building. Mm -hmm. Make sure she was still happy with the arrangements there. She was fine. I did check with White and Community to make sure they were fine. Um, we did make a number of changes two years ago with the facility where they, the space they're using, and we really like the way it's set up now because it's all in one area of the building. Um, we did make that change there. Um, we did increase to, um, it was a substantial amount in FY15. So we thought that, you know, it's still a reasonable amount um, that we are charging. And the way that, you know, that we look at it too is, is they are servicing our students and children of, of, uh, of Douglas. Is so this is, I'm sorry? Was there enrollment? Is it, do you, any idea? Is it up or down? Year year? To be honest with you, no. No, I don't. For this year, I do not know. No. I will ask, though. Yeah, I will ask. Yeah, I know. And they've always they've always been full as far as um, whether or not they have a waiting list or anything like that, you know, as far as that goes. Yeah, actually they have a list been full. Um, no other changes whatsoever to the agreement okay. from the prior year. So we'll be looking for a motion to approve the licensing agreement between the Douglas Public Schools and the Wayne Community Center for uh, July first, twenty seventeen, through. June 30th of 2018. So moved. So, so, so well, I want to repeat it. <laughs> Second. All those in favor? Aye. Very good. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Now we'll move over to Mr. Means. Okay, so the superintendent report. Um, just one thing I'll, I wanted to start with that to bring to everybody's attention is um, we made, I wanted to make, make everybody aware that we've made some modifications out and back during the recess time uh, at the two schools. We've, we've procure, uh, procured some cones and barriers just to put out that are, that are easily moved, just as a safety barrier. Uh, we will um, be talking with uh, the town and in, in, in sharing it with them as well, but I wanted you to know that we did this, I, get, I think yesterday was the, when we got the, uh, the barriers. Um, it came to our attention that cars and, and vehicles are using that when there is recess in there so our, our thought was that if we put some barriers out there that are easily moved they're just a cone and a, and a, and a bar going across that can be easily moved it just will get people to slow down and uh, make it a little bit safer out there so um, just wanted in case you hear anything about that we did that starting yesterday I think or today it was maybe today I think <clears throat> uh, the first thing on the report is for uh, Mr. Romano from the high school to share with us his presentation on the Douglas High School performance on advanced placement exams. Hey, it works. <laughs> Good evening, and uh, before I go over the data, I do want to do a couple plugs. Our winter concert is tomorrow um, at the high school here at 7 p.m. Love to have people come out and join us for that. And the winter sports season begins on Friday with girls basketball at home. The JV game is at 5, and the varsity is at 6.30. So. All right, advanced placement. Look, it, it all works. So advanced placement is a program. Uh, it's created by the College Board, the same people that do the SATs. And the idea is that high school students take college-level courses, um, and at the end of the year, they take an exam that's also provided by the College Board. And if the student gets a at least a three on a five-point scale, most colleges will accept AP courses for college credit. So um, this, my daughter, for example, basically took her entire first semester of college in high school, which was great for um, when the college bills came in. So it's a great opportunity for kids. Also shows that they're capable of college-level work. Even if a student doesn't get the qualifying score, just the fact that they challenge themselves to take the course, which they're very challenging, um, looks great on a student's application for college. So um, these next two, this, this slide and the next one, uh, I continued to track, as Mr. Maines had been tracking, 
um, our success of students who passed the AP exams going back to 2007. So these are our totals over 11 years in various subjects. Had a couple of milestones this year. Um, U.S. government politics, over 100 students have passed that one. And um, the AP language and composition, that's an 11th grade AP exam, uh, hit over 200 this year. Um, and, oops, there we go. Over here, um, a few of the courses are up there, like you see like a one, those are online courses. So a student can choose to take an online course too. It's already a very challenging course, but we've had some students take, take them online. So we're not running courses of like one student, but um, those are st students who took them through VHS. And we did last year, we had hit 1,000 qualifying scores since 2007. So this year we have gone over 1,000. So we averaged just under um, about 100 passing scores per year on AP exams. Is there, oh, do you mind if I ask a question? Oh, please. <laughs> is there an added expense, whether it be through VHS or just having a teacher for the curriculum for an AP course? There, so for the student, there is, in the sense that the student has to pay for the exam, mm -hmm. for example, which you, know, there, you can get a discount for uh, pre-reduced lunch students. Um, uh, so there is that expense. For us, uh, in a lot of ways, it, it, it basically replaces like a section of honors that we might have run before. So instead of having like two sections of honors English for seniors, we might run a section of AP and a section of, of honors. So I wouldn't really say that there's a, a significant cost in, in that sense. Yeah, with the virtual high school students that are taking it, we secure so many seats during the course of the year. Um, so if there's no additional expense for them. Oh, to take oh, a, yeah. A, when one student takes a course, no, that's yep. just that's part of our allotment of right. 20 or 25 seats. That okay. We have. It's so. really it, it's it's a great use because you you wouldn't be able to do you know a, a course or we, a course that we can't offer or if you only have one student who's genuinely interested in it, you wouldn't take a teaching assignment for one student. You right. would. That's why the online is, is is an interesting component and and um, uh, we're pretty particular that they. If we offer it in the classroom, you, don't, you can't take it online. It, it, it needs to take it in the classroom. Yeah, so there, I'm sorry, there isn't any added, added cost. So um, up there, are total enrollments going back for the past 11 years. This year, the enrollment's at 154. So it's, it's holding steady, but the classes, the junior and senior classes the last couple of years have been somewhat smaller. So in general, they're holding pretty steady. Yeah. A lot of numbers here. Um, but the point of this is that, that we do better than the national and, and or excuse me, the state and global average in a lot of our exams. We're well above state average in literature and composition in U.S. government. Um, now, U.S. history took a dip this year. Um, it's the same guy. Sometimes you, you will dip because it, we're, they're small sample sizes. They're, they're, class, they're small classes, 10, 11, 12 kids sometimes. Um, in the U.S. history case, the, the test actually changed. And uh, it just kind of shows the need to continue to invest in ongoing PD in order to make sure that, that our, our staff are able to deliver the content right. So this is a, you know, a teacher who's been at 90% and now he's 90% passing and, and took a significant dip. A few of the other courses, um, biology, environmental science, both above state average. So uh, chemistry was taught by a pretty new teacher. I have a lot of faith that she's gonna improve her scores this year. Uh, physics, the, it's a new teacher teaching it this year. What he's running into is there's a foundation level of knowledge that students have to have leading up to it. And I'm not sure that his kids this year have that, but we're revamping curriculum to make sure that that happens. And Spanish was phenomenal. She, she had a great year. If, if, if I could just jump in real quick on that, Josh. The uh, chemistry, uh, actually, she just, just left. I walked into her just about 10 minutes ago. She was leaving the building, so she was still here working. But she's a young chemistry teacher. Um, and um, very committed to what she's doing, yep. uh, but sort of, she's a biology chem, and her real passion was biology, but um, we convinced her to do the chem, and um, she was a first year teacher who took on the, ex the added experience of A, training right before the start of the school year, and then teaching it that very first year. So last year was the very first year. She was hired in August, trained in August, and started teaching it in August. So um, we anticipate that it'll be a little bit stronger. I would tell you that the first year we offered AP Chemistry, we had a 0, 0.00. First year we did it. And it's, it's continued to increase over time. So um, I, there's no question in the physics is the same thing. We had a new teacher last year, we ha and now we have a new teacher again this year. So the yeah. consistency there is, is a little bit problematic. But um, 
confident the chemistry will come up and the physics will come up as well. All right, so some of the individual ones. Um, AP Language and Composition, again, this is, uh, this is a great one for students going to college. And this is the one, I think we have the highest numbers in this one. Um, because it teaches a lot of analytical thinking, analytical writing, analytical reading. Um, great one for college um, prep. And you said it doesn't count if it's below three? It, it won't count for college credit. Colleges won't give credit. Again, still looks great on the transcript if the student challenged themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, AP Literature, uh, phenomenal scores there. So that's, the, the previous one is for 11th graders. This one's for seniors. The drop off in numbers is because a lot of colleges, if, if a kid takes two <coughs> years of AP English, they'll usually only give them credit for one year. So a lot of kids opt to not take it the second year and take other AP courses instead. Because when, it, when a student's taking more than three AP courses, they're really challenged, they're really, really pushing themselves. And, and so this is the one that kids tend to drop so that they can take some of the other ones. But phenomenal success rates, that's Emily Mayo. Yeah. This is the AP Chem, like Mr. Um, Main said. New teacher, we think she'll do better. Uh, AP Bio, it's a small sample, but great success there. That's Mr. Thayer. Same with AP Environmental, Mr. Wagenheim. Um, small sample, but great performance by uh, the students. AP Physics, this is the one, you know, again, uh, it's a very tough test, too. And AP Physics 1 is relatively new. They revamped that test a couple years ago, too. Oops. AP Calc AB. Great success rates by Miss Brainy. We've offered BC in the past as well. Um, we didn't offer that last year, but we're looking on how we can kind of arrange curriculum so that more kids can take that AP Calc BC, these levels of calculus that I didn't even know existed when I was in college as an English and history major. AP Stats, uh, it, it goes up and down. A lot of kids take stats. It's a great course for kids to have before they go off to college. I wish I had had stats before I went to college. Um, it, it goes up and down. This one, we're working on this one too. Government and politics, great success there. A lot of fives in government and politics. Five, that's the top score. AP Micro, um, I would pretty certain that all those kids had never taken an economics course before they sat down to take that course. It's a very challenging one. Um, not one that I would have been particularly adept at teaching myself, so. And this is the only school I've ever been at that offered AP Micro. But I was going to mention that, if you recall, one of the things that we, we showed you, that the course offerings and, and did some comparisons, we're probably the only school district in the area that, that continues to offer the, the microeconomics. Yeah, that's, that's a rare one. Is there any regular economics classes? No. There is no what they, they basically so have is, is what they've gotten in history courses. So their first exposure is in AP. Yeah. So. Um, AP US history, we had talked about, you know, again, the, the need to, to keep teachers current in it is, is huge. There's an investment in that, though, too. Um, the, the training sessions that they do, they're usually a week long. I went to St. Johnsboro College for a week when I did mine. Mm -hmm. um, great food. But it's, it's very intense and, and a great preparation program for it. But if you're missing that, that prep piece, it really is hard to, to teach the test. And, and, and U.S. history historically has had phenomenal results. It really 90% has. In, in, a, in a very tough it, test. It's, it's, been, it's been unbelievable. For some reason last year, well, like you said, the new test is part of it yeah. and, and being prepared for the new test. And, and that's a very tough test anyway because, you know, with, like with English, if you can analyze a, a poem, it doesn't matter if you've never read that particular poem they ask you about in the test. If they ask you a question about the Kennedy administration, you don't know anything about the Kennedy administration. You can't work your way through it. It's, you just, you know, so it's, it's very content-based. Spanish language and culture, this is a new one for us. 100% um, success rate, uh, the four kids. The class is growing this year, it's up to seven. And, and if I could, that, that class of four was a combination. Remember we've talked about how we've had to combine classes, so a group of honors level students were taking it along with the, 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 the AP students at the same right. time. Hmm. So it wasn't a class of four students, it was a class of probably 11 students, but we had some students did not choose to go to the um, AP level, so we combined them. So we can still give the kids the opportunity to take the AP test. Yeah, and that actually is the way the course is running this year, too. There are seven AP kids and then like s seven or ten Spanish. On a Spanish five, I think. Yeah, on a Spanish five. What's the minimum size you'll have for an AP class? I wouldn't want to run them with, I really don't want to run them with less than seven. Yeah. But we've, we've done, mo usually it's been ten. Yeah. Uh, you saw some of those numbers that dropped. Doesn't, what, what, what we start with in August might not always be what we finish with in 
So um, most of the kids know that by October 1, if, you, if this is not for you, you need to jettison and, and, and take something else. And it does, sometimes more, a, a few kids will opt not to take the test, mm -hmm. which should all cause to not take right. it. Yeah. Right. Be, right. I, I think because they're figuring they're not going to do well. So overall, we are well above state and national, uh, state, national, and global averages in our success rates. Uh, AP is, is very challenging. You're asking a high school student to take a college level course and Honestly, I kind of think they're more difficult than a lot of undergraduate college level courses. We are working on a plan to try to, um, to improve in the areas that I think that we need to. For example, uh, we used to call it lay the foundation, and I think that you guys did when um, you were associated with the MIMSI group. Mm -hmm. MIMSI was a um, Massachusetts math and science initiative that came in and they did a lot of professional development with teachers, um, helped build the programs up to where they are. Um, so I think that prepping more kids as freshmen and sophomores to be ready for juniors is sort of the way to go. So for example, um, history courses, you do more work with primary source documents, and then they're more familiar with how to use those, which is a big part of the, the US history test. Um, physics, one of the big things is to revamp and, and strengthen our um, the physics courses that we have before kids take the AP. I think that that's um, the way that we can that we should work on that. How do the AP classes work with a student's transcript? Is it is it shows up as AP. based on the test score? No, it's it's test on their transcript. It's based on the the score that they earn. Although it is a weighted grade, so they it's almost ten. So basically, like getting an eighty in an AP course is essentially like it, it weighs it as a ninety mm -hmm. in the, in the student's transcript. The Same actual thing with score on the test. Is, honors level has a gradation as well. So the, if you if you take college prep, it's it's a straight number. Honors level, there's, there's an increase, uh, uh, and then AP, you get an increase. So the uh, so the grade point average reflects the challenge of the of the course. The scores don't appear in the transcripts because we actually don't get the scores for seniors until after they graduate. We get them mid summer, and, and they don't impact the grade on the transcript. It doesn't. No. doesn't. No. So there's another program that goes with uh, AP, and that they recognize individual students who have excelled at, at the test. So AP scholars are students <coughs> who score, get a qualifying score in three or more AP exams. They have to average three on all of their exams. AP scholar with honors average score of 3.25, and they score at least a three on four or more exams. Scholars with distinction average score of 3.5 and score at least three on five or more exams. And then for the National AP Scholar. We have had those at Douglas High School in the past. Yeah. They have to have an average score of four on every test that they've taken, and they have to score four or above on eight tests. A lot of high school kids wow. don't take eight over the course of their time. Yeah. So uh, not particularly surprising. We don't have a scholar with uh, a national AP Scholar this year. We have in the past. But this, the class of 2017 that just graduated had 10 students recognized as AP Scholars. One student recognized an, as an AP scholar with honor, and six recognized as AP scholars with distinction. Th those, are, those are huge numbers, and I, do, I don't actually know these students, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mr. Maines yeah. does. So, the, so you got Megan Briggs, you got Victoria Desolettes, um, Rachel and, and Dylan. Kind of the same shirts. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Match nice them. look. Miss, Miss Peck. We didn't plan that. <laughs> so uh, somebody named Connor Grady and uh, Shanna King, Olivia Willette. Maddie Peck and Rebecca Rockney. Now I do know this next student because we do have one student, Alec Goldenberg. I played soccer with him in a soccer practice. I ran track with him Monday, mm -hmm. uh, last Friday rather. Uh, I was still hurting on Monday. So Alec <laughs> is a member of the class of 2018. So he's a senior this year. He has already qualified as an AP scholar. Mm -hmm. So he's already met that benchmark. So by the end of this year, I anticipate that he may have moved up into the scholar with honors or scholar with distinction category. So Alec, I do know he's, he's already going to make the, 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 that award. Mm -hmm. We have so one AP scholar with honor. So that's Sean Murphy, um, graduated last year, yep. And then our scholars with distinction. Okay, so Grant and Taylor. Um, I think Grant would have been seven, and I think Taylor would have been seven exams with qualifying scores. Just missing that the, the national. National. Yep. Uh, uh, Rory and Meredith. I wanted to hear you pronounce her last name. I practiced it. Shemini. That's not how they had me practice it. Okay. Well they, <laughs> <laughs> um, so Matt Saucier and Pat Pat Sullivan, and Sophie Thorson. A lot of these kids were athletes too, huh? Yeah, they were involved in a lot, or, or band, 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 chorus, course, yeah. or all of those things. Um, so thank you. For, so. One of the things before Josh uh, steps down is that um, we had a 52% success rate this year, which was a 
dip, which most schools would be happy to be going up to a 52. So we've been averaging 63, 64, 65, somewhere in that ballpark over the years. One of the things that is, is, is very obvious is um, the drop in enrollment is having an impact on numbers of students participating. Um, so that's one of the, one of the pieces that, that's, that's an issue. Some changes in, 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 in testing, as Josh mentioned, and also changes in staffing. So um, that was just that one of those years. Um, and I, I'm pretty confident that we'll continue to re be at that number. I don't know that we'll ever get back up to those numbers of, in, of participation in the 200s because our numbers have come down uh, in enrollment. So I, don't, I just don't see us having that many students and taking them in junior and senior year. Uh, we, at this point, do not have any sophomores taking any AP, so it's really just a junior and senior class. Uh, so that's part of it. I think, I, I think you'll see us being more in the area of 150, 160, 170 for participation going forward. I just don't see us with the enrollments to, to get us back up to the 200 number. Performance-wise, that's, that's all based on how students do and so forth. The upside to it is our kids are still taking the, the, the challenge, and um, it's a challenge. And I know we've got some parents in here who have AP students in, in, in the room, and there's, there's a lot. There's a lot. And if you're taking three or four of them, there's a wicked lot, <laughs> a wicked lot of work. So can I ask you a question? Are you saying that when they are seniors, if they're taking AP classes, that has no impact on their final GPA? Oh, no, it does. Oh, no, yeah, it does. It's just yes. the actual the test itself. itself. The, the College Board test does not. Oh, um, okay. Factor in no, it it, it very much so it just it, they're weighted grades and they're weighted very highly, so it, it does count. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yep. I didn't think I understood that right. So thank <laughs> no, you for clarifying no, that one. And and to speak to Mr. Main's point, our our low year is higher than pre the school I taught at and the the school that I was administrator before. It was higher. Our low years is higher than their highest years. Mm -hmm. So and it was one of the things that that drew me to Douglas was when I looked up the the AP scores and I said well. I, I thought it must have been a mistake at first, um, because that, that is phenomenal. And, and we do, you know, we'll never be at 100%, because the only way to be at a 100% would be if you severely limit the kids who can take them. And that's not, we'd rather kids challenge themselves and get a two on the test, or get a one on the test, mm -hmm. than, than not take a chance on, you know, just say, oh, I don't know that that kid's gonna make it, they better not take <coughs> it. I'd rather have them take it. Because it's, even if they don't get that qualifying score, it's still a benefit to them to, to take the challenge, have it on their transcript, mm -hmm. See, kind of get an idea of what a college course is like. So. And that was a that was a cultural shift, and, and, and Mr. Romano had mentioned it, and if you looked at the numbers of participation, it, it was at 57, it was at 60, it was at 63, and then all of a sudden it went up to like 160. And that's when we made that cultural shift, which was that it was what we weren't going to keep the APs as, um, as being sort of an exclusive club. It was going to be open to anyone who wanted to take on the challenge mm -hmm. of, of, of an advanced placement course. And that's why our numbers went up dramatically. So you'll still see schools who have really great scores, but they don't make it available to all students. They, they limit participation. They have, and we had it before. We had high qualification pre prerequisites. You had to take this, you had to take that, you had to take this. You had to have a 95 in this and a 95 in that and 95 in that in order to get into, even to get into an AP. So when we d made that cultural shift, um, I, it, it has paid, I think it's paid tr tremendous dividends because lots of students who never would have even considered taking an advanced placement class are taking an advanced placement classes. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I always want to share, and, and I've always said when I was making the presentation that Mr. Romano made, is that it doesn't happen when they walk into Douglas High School in grade nine. This is a growth process from the time they walk into the primary school to the time they get into that testing. There's a, there's a, there's a, a learning curve, and there's a lot of people that are involved in that. You know, Mr. Rin gets credit for being the stats teacher, or Ms. Brainy gets credit for being the AP um, uh, calc teacher, but a lot of things happened in a lot of other people's classrooms mm -hmm. to get them to that point. And they don't, it's important they don't to suddenly become capable of doing calculus. Absolutely, so. mm. right. So let's never really get to the point where we suddenly can do calculus. So. All right. Very good. Thank, Thank you, you very you. much. Thank, Thank you, you so you. much. Okay, I think somehow, some way we have another document that I'm gonna show you. Um, one of the things that I wanted to do, and, and I, I, I will begin by saying that Mrs. Urquhart is not feeling well. She's been out uh, the, in and out the last couple of days. Um, and so, um, but one of the things that I had asked her to do was uh, over the 
recent weeks, you've made some appointments, and, and, and I wanted to share with you um, some of the people that we brought in and for staff members on those new appointments that, that you approved just recently. But I also wanted to sort of give you a look at our, we never really, we always talk about the new teachers that we brought on board, and I never really introduced you to the new paraprofessionals that we brought on board. So you have a piece of paper in front of you, but we also have it on the screen. Um, and I want to be very clear that these are not all brand new positions that we just implemented here at Douglas High School. These, I mean, Douglas Public Schools. These are all positions that existed, plus a few that we've just recently added uh, based on um, uh, service delivery grid in, in, in meeting needs of students. So um, what I wanted to share with you is, is that these are all brand new people to our district and, and also share with you the fact that um, our paraprofessional staff are pretty well educated and pretty well prepared. As you can see, virtually all of them are, are higher education uh, degreed individuals from some very nice colleges as well. So, uh, I mean, we're bringing in and we're always, in the, always looking for uh, people who are um, uh, well-schooled, very knowledgeable, and, but also have the ability to work with all types of learners. And so as you look from, um, let's see here. Mr. Romano, Paul, Ra is it? Rachi. Rachi. Okay, from Paul Rachi down are the new appointments that you, that you made. And you can see he is just below Jessica Mulcahy. So all of those from Jessica Mulcahy up were people that were hired for September and have been with us. The newer appointments are, remember we had some openings that did not get filled and then you appointed some additional people. So I wanted you to see that we've brought in Paul. We've got uh, April Beaupre is at the middle school. She's a Framingham State graduate. We've got Annie DeWitt who joined the Flex Center here at the high school. Uh, UMass graduate. Um, Mr. Um, Delaney brought in Tyler uh, Morrill who is a um, um, Filey Dickinson University um, graduate. Uh, Mary Ellen Cole is at the primary school from with Mrs. Uh, Socher, and she is a Leiden State graduate. Jamie Russo is filling in as a long-term substitute for maternity. Um, she is a William Patterson University graduate, and, and Heather Blanchett is also a long-term um, substitute, and she is at the elementary school, and she is filling in for um, uh, Jeannie uh, Fitzpatrick, and she's there for the rest of the year. Uh, has many years of experience as an educator as well, and she's a Worcester State uh, graduate. And um, then Chris Gray at the very bottom has, is, is going to be doing an AP, uh, a, 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 P, ABA position at the primary school. So we have one position still remaining, which is an ABA at the primary school. And we have filled all the other positions. Uh, as you know, um, throughout the court, from the beginning of the year to now, we did have some people who um, left, opted to go elsewhere or we um, chose to, to move on and hire someone else for the position. So we are completely filled and, and have all of our uh, paraprofessional staff in place except for one ABA, which we, we, I know we had some interviews scheduled with Mrs. Urquhart being out. They have not held those interviews, so we hope to have that filled uh, as soon as possible. But also, um, uh, you know, as I said, we always talk about the faculty, the new faculty, and I just wanted to share with you that um, the people that we're hiring as paraprofessionals and ABAs and long-term subs are all um, educate uh, are all highly educated individuals as well. Thank you. So there's a quick update. If I could ask Mr. Cedarbaum to come up, and he and I will share a little bit of information with you um, on a on a meeting that took place this morning. Um, as you know, um, the last professional development day was dedicated, half the day was dedicated to um, implementing the ALICE protocols within the schools with the teachers. Uh, since that time, um, the middle school and the high school have done modified ALICE drills, which is m really more instructional than actual physical activity. Um, and and um, Mrs. Social will be up in a minute to talk about the, the, the most recent uh, ALICE protocol that they did at their building. We met today and we have put in place a plan for the upcoming January um, Professional Development Day where we will spend two hours again in ALICE training. And so the plan is going to be that we will do two schools in the morning, 
two schools in the afternoon. That way we only need really two teams rather than trying to get four teams. So it works out pretty well. So um, Sam can maybe share a little bit of what came out of our meeting today as well. Um, so in January, we're hoping to uh, reinforce with the staff some of the techniques that we practiced in the fall, uh, try to solidify some of the things that we have gone over, get them to feel more confident, again, in their ability uh, to implement ALICE, uh, and one of the only ways to do it is to continue with practice. Um, so we'll be running some longer, more at length drills. Um, in the fall, we practiced five different scenarios. This time around, we're looking at maybe only doing two um, that will be longer in duration, uh, and then we'll have longer periods of time to debrief afterwards. Um, the other thing that we talked about is looking into how are we going to equip our classrooms with materials, supplies, um, and other necessities um, in the event that we need to go into some type of enhanced lockdown. Um, so we discussed uh, the different things that we could look at as far as options, looking at gathering donations from the community, uh, whether it be from a, uh, a store or a local business that could help us fill some of those uh, holes that we're looking for. Uh, we maybe take a ride down to Blissful Meadows and see if they want to donate any of their practice golf balls that can go into that that bucket that can be thrown at people and so forth. But um, so there is some there there is we have been looking a little bit more at um, things that we need to do within our buildings. So for example, one of the one of our, our dilemmas is just this room alone creates an interesting piece. This door opens in, that door opens out, and so you can secure this door but it's much more difficult to secure that door. So there are some things that we can do, and we are looking at some, some, some different activities. Um, we have a student who is going to make some of those, what we call them chalk, block, chalk blocks, that we're gonna put in a door that opens in with a piece of rubber on the bottom of them to keep them stable. Um, that would allow us to, you know, to secure that door so that it won't be able to be opened. Um, there's some other things that we have in place. Uh, the primary school has some older doors, and we're looking at um, devices that are affixed to the door, and they drop down and, and, and will be, be used to secure the door. One of the things that we're talking about is looking at, we, is looking at some keys, and, and, and do we have the right keys in everybody's hands? Uh, they talk about having a sort of a survival bucket in your room, which is a five-gallon drum that has things like Band-Aids and, and, and water and... Um, uh, juice for, for in case you have a diabetic student and just s s things that you might need um, they're expensive you can go out and buy a bucket for <laughs> what was it eighty four dollars I think it was for one bucket and all we need is I think two hundred and <laughs> something of them. so we decided that might not be the best way for us to go is is to buy the pre pre-made and so we thought maybe with the help of the maybe the PTO and some other people to go out and, and, and solicit um, donations, we might be able to get those made um, significantly less expensive and, and have them in classrooms. So uh, the other piece of it that we will come back and share with you is that the buildings will have to do continued practice on this. And so, but one of the things that we're talking about doing in the high school and the middle school buildings is the next time that we do it, I shouldn't say that, within the, before the school year gets out, is to do one that also involves the opportunity for students to evacuate the building and what that looks like and so forth. So where they would rally and, and how we would do that. So for example, if the, Mr. Romano were to come on the speaker and say that there's a, um, an intruder in the building in the main foyer, we know the people in these buildings are gonna go down those stairs and right out the door and, and, and off into the woods and, and have a rallying point and so forth. Well, we wanna try that. We want to try and see what it looks like to get all those students out in an orderly fashion and in, and in a safe fashion. Whereas that might not translate real well for the primary school or for the elementary school. And so, as we have talked about all along, different strategies for different buildings. So um, the, the plan would be to do this in the January uh, professional development with the teachers and then to come back sometime and do probably internal work um, in the um, the end of the winter and then in the in the spring when the weather gets a little better to try to do something that's going to get us out of the building and, and, and go from there. If we if we are going to do an evacuation, um, I would look to also and try to involve the state police and um, the uh, as many groups as we possibly can that would normally be here in an emergency situation, which is not always easy to orchestrate. So, but so that's the plan going forward and. Um, 
we will certainly keep you updated as to how that's going to go and uh, i'll be sharing this information we'll be sharing it with the the staff in, in advance so they'll know that that's something that we'll be doing thank you okay. thank you, well, thank you mr cedarbaugh if i could have mrs Sosha come up because one of the concerns that i know that you all had was um it, it has to be different for the primary school so um, cindy um <laughs> And the staff at the primary school conducted a, a lockdown just recently, which went very, very well, but I'll let you talk about it. You already covered everything, Mr. Maines. I'm not covering it. I didn't say anything about the primary school yet. Keys. Um, so we did one on November 29th. Parents were notified in advance, which is normal, what we usually do. Um, they followed the standard traditional lockdown procedures. The doors were already locked. They closed the door. Um, they kind of have a tiger paw in the room where that's where the children go and huddle and stay in place in that corner. Um, nothing else was done. It's just close the door, it is locked, cover the window, things like that. Uh, we did have Officer Brett there to help us. We had the police chief, Miglianico, there, Officer Blaniaz, and then we had Mr. Maines and Ms. Keegan there to just kind of go through the building with us. So that went very well. The children were. Perfect. The teachers had practiced ahead of time with them. There was no tears, no one crying or anything like that. So it was fine. It was quick. So now it comes to what do we do for the Alice. So if you know our building, it's one long hallway. Um, Officer Brett came to our staff meeting the following Monday and we talked about these different options. You know, what is feasible for us to do? One, we've got the age to deal with. They can't get out quickly they're not going to go on their own. If you have one teacher in the room, that's a problem. Most rooms had a couple of teachers in there, whether it was a para or a teacher, so you know, we talked about that, um, possibly sharing a staff. If you had three adults in your room because of one-to-ones, open the door, here's one adult. So we talked about doing that. Um, basically, it's barricading and not evacuating is what we came out with. Ways to barricade the doors, like Mr. Main was saying, these little drop down bars, all of our doors open in. So we had talked about pushing a, a wedge under the door, but then we realized all the doors had a different spacing. So mm -hmm. that would be difficult to do. So then we looked at these other items. We are hoping to purchase just a set so we could try it out in one room without purchasing for the whole building. Uh, we talked about tipping tables on the side. So even though they're sheltering in a corner, tip the table, it would block them a little bit more. We talked about, um, Officer Brett gave them this handout with seven tips for the classroom setup. So that the teacher should be looking at, gee, if I have this near the door, I could slide it myself probably, whether it's a cabinet, a file cabinet, or a bookshelf or something like that. So it's more of a barricading. Um, with the, your adrenaline <coughs> flowing, I'm sure you can move Absolutely. anything. Absolutely, right. <laughs> Um, the other thing, uh, we found d different things that we have never practiced. We always do a drill in the morning. So what if we're in the cafeteria when it happens? And that's where the key situation came in. Whoever is in there might not have a key. If they're locked, they're unlocked, we don't know. Um, <coughs> there are two different keys for three doors. So we, we realize that we have an issue with keys there. Um, issue with bathrooms. Who's checking a bathroom that's down the hallway? to see if there is a child in there. So we've got to work some of those things out. The library was a problem. A lot of windows in the library came up with a solution for that. They go to the classroom next door, which is the Title I room. So typically there would only be five or six children in there. So that worked out. Um, the gym was another issue. They have an outside door. Great, you can go outside, but we don't know what's outside. So we can't just send them out there. So we have a room that they can go into, which is the teacher's lunchroom, but again, that's locked from the gym. So that teacher needs a key for that room to get in there. So we are looking into keys. Jeff yep. Collette already has you know, a proposal out there looking for a bid on how can we deal with the key issue and re-key the whole building mm -hmm. so that we all have one key that fits everything. Mm -hmm. So that was an option. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, we did talk about if you know, worse came to worse, and we talk about evacuation, it would be the windows. It would be, if you know there's somebody in that hallway and we're saying there's an intruder in the hallway, hopefully they're not going to be able to get through the door because we've got them barricaded, but 
the uh, window is an option. Mm -hmm. And then where would we be sending them? Teacher would be last, you have to have a meeting place, and so on. Mm -hmm. And possibly have to break some windows, so we don't know. That was one of the things that we talked about being in the bucket, was that those the devices ballot. that mm -hmm. you could break the windows right. with, yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely different um, challenges. Yes. Because I'm, I'm picturing that building. In one hallway, it's just, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, if someone said, okay, intruder in to the cafeteria wing, maybe two classes at the end of first grade could get out and head down Gleason Court. Mm -hmm. Right. It's risky. Mm -hmm. Very, because the kids don't because move Because you fast. can move in a minute, and yeah. that intruder could be in that main hallway. Yeah. It's just one hallway all the way down, and you right. know that's why we're, we're more into the barricading right now. Yeah. And the only way out would be through the windows. Right. And the kids are small enough, I think we could. Mm -hmm. If we had to, mm -hmm. that, that's the next best thing. It, interesting though, because you can't practice that. No. And you know, when you think about fire drills and how much you practice on fire drills, mm -hmm. that you know, the kids aren't fearful when they hear the fire no. alarm go off because they know what they're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. But in this circumstance, it's just a, right. it brings it to a different level. Right. And then you're talking about three-year-olds in the preschool. Yeah. Mm. So. Mm -hmm. And the kids are the first ones out? That's what we that, talked about. That's, that's what Officer scary. Brett said. Yeah. You know, the teacher should be the last, captain of the ship, last one yeah. off. So, I mean, it's different if you have Descent, two adults, three adults in the rooms, which preschool would. They would have three adults. So you could have someone go out and then take the kids and kind of shove, shovel them down the hallway or wherever they're going to go into the woods. But when you have one classroom with one teacher, first grade, there are a couple. That's why we talked about sharing somebody next door. If you know you have to three, open that door and give us one so that they can help. Right. Mm. So it, I thought it went very well as well. The it kids, did. you couldn't hear a, a sound. Um, and, and that that's pretty amazing for, for amazing. the kids three years old, yeah. four years old, five yeah. years old. Um, yeah. And when it was all said and done, I didn't see any kids that were upset or bothered or troubled by the whole thing. So your staff obviously did a great job of preparing them for that, mm -hmm. um, which is which we have to do. We're right. going to have to do. It's, it's unfortunate that this is the world we live in, but mm -hmm. we we do. You know? yeah. when, when I was a kid, we ducked and covered. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, we talked about our little Anybody? bucket yeah, of what you have. have. <laughs> tennis ball, <laughs> shelters. Tennis ball. Get the micro <laughs> tennis ball just to distract. Um, Officer Brett said, get some bee spray, the one that shoots like 30, right. 30 feet. Yeah. Yeah, well, we can't have it in school. <laughs> There's a problem. Yeah. So um, they did a great job, and, 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 and kudos to you, you and the staff and, and everybody, and, they, um, and, and, and it went really well. And, and, and for taking the time, all of us taking the time to really look at some of the some of the barriers that we have to mm -hmm. we have to overcome if we're gonna we're gonna be better prepared for that building. Mm -hmm. So, um, thank you. Okay. Good. Thank you, Cindy. Excellent. Okay. Then the last thing that I have is um, is, a, is a short video clip, but I wanted to just preface it by showing it, to telling you that um, at a recent uh, Blackstone Valley Superintendents meeting. Uh, the um, Joe Maruschek is the um, superintendent of the Menden Upton School District, and uh, he in wanted to invite school committee members, administrators, and, and, and other superintendents, uh, put out the, the invitation to attend a uh, presentation on Monday, December the 11th at 7 o'clock at Nipmuc Regional. The uh, presentation is a, is a full-length feature called Most Likely to Succeed. It is all about taking a critical look at the American educational system. Uh, it, is a, it was a book written by Tony Wagner and Ted Dintersmith. Uh, Ted Dintersmith is going to be present at the presentation. He will be there to do a follow-up uh, and then also to do, some, uh, do a question and answer for us. Uh, it's an interesting opportunity to um, share with other Blackstone Valley um, administrators and uh, school committee representatives. It was an awfully generous offer on the part of um, the Mended Upton School District to invite us to attend. Uh, I am planning on attending um, it, it Monday night, and uh, there is a sign-up in your packet, in your information. There is a place called the uh, 
uh, Genius Link. Uh, they have one for me, which is the less intelligent link. Um, <laughs> but they do have a sign-up link called the Genius Link, and you can sign up for um, to attend the the conference because seating is limited. Uh, they do ha they are making it available to the uh, parents of the men and up in the school district. So they have a their um, auditorium is is you know a little bit bigger than what we have, so they can seat a few more people. But they, it does come with a three minute video clip that we could show if, if our cameraman and also a crack technician can can get this for us uh, let you take a quick look at it I don't know if you want to get a better seat by sitting up here but if you can see there that's fine. good yeah. it's up to you I'll just watch it over there oh. slide over here don't you do it yeah the way too it's a little trick of the trade huh we divide the day up uh, in high schools into bits of time, you know, into 40 or 50 minute blocks. Every day. You know, we ring bells and people start to shuffle around the room and do something else. That's an organizational device, it's not an educational principle. University of Heads, in 1890, said, in 11th grade, everyone should learn chemistry. In senior year, everyone should learn physics. A lot of these subjects are great, but these priorities were, were dictated 124 years ago. The old blue-collar industrial model of education is already gone. We're already living in its wake. What happens to society when hundreds of millions of people have that aimless, rudderless feeling of, I've been replaced by a very small bot? I don't know if there's a solution. This isn't the way to do it. This is the way that I did it. If the assignment is you get it back and you crumple it up and throw it in the trash can, that's kind of one student experience. And if the assignment is to produce something that you're going to present to professionals in the field, that's completely changing the, the whole dynamic. We are trying to have that type of reflexivity and curiosity get inculcated in our students. Saying your parents, all your friends' parents, people you don't know are going to be here to see the work you did. It creates a, an aspect about authenticity, because we are creating something for an audience. The things I think in life that give us some of the greatest satisfaction is making something that wasn't there before. And I can't wait for that moment when it does work, and I completely believe it. And there's like always, it, it'll be the greatest thing. Kids have that feeling is transformative. I did this, and I did this. Thank you, Scott. Good. So, it's a conversation that, as an administrative team, since uh, the summer, we've been really talking about and you're going to hear more about it uh, we've been working on developing um, the district uh, improvement plan uh, all of our administrators have done a, a ton of work around and you'll hear this at the next meeting around the MCAS and data and, and mining for data and, and using data to 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 manipulate or to improve instruction planning assessments um, the model that we've all gone through, it keeps things organized and it keeps things moving in the right direction. But as, as, as they said in, the, in that trailer, is that it's, it's probably a model that has seen its day and probably saw its day about 10 years ago and really maybe even 20 years ago. And uh, we, we, we really need to start moving towards um, interactive learning, uh, active learning, we really need to start getting into um, uh, being able to explain and, and write about why you did what you did, how you solved the problem, what the problem really was, analyzing and, and, and critically solving a problem. Um, and slowly but surely, we're moving in that direction, but it is, um, it's a cultural shift. It really is a cultural shift because we're so used to, you know, um, 
the bell ringing and you go to your next period class. And um, you know, there's there's lots of literature out there now about linking your courses and making the li linking classes and making them very interdisciplinary. Um, all of that stuff is out there, and it's going to take time. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, but we look to champion and look to engage and, and get our faculty on board um, and see the value and the merit in it. So uh, I'm looking forward to going to see the presentation on Monday night. Um, I, I'm a, a true fan of, of shaking it up a little bit. The, 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 the standard model worked for a while, but it, it really doesn't work as well as it really as it, it should work in, in our classrooms. So. Um, you know, the old mindset was that if it was noisy in the classroom, the teacher wasn't doing a very good job, when the reality is it really should be noisy in a classroom, mm -hmm. and it should be collaborative, and it should be sharing, and, and, and it should be learning that's uh, noisy and, 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 and productive, however. Mm -hmm. So just something to think about. I think it will be an interesting uh, presentation, he, and I'm, I, I appreciate them making it available to us, and if you can attend, please, please do. I'll see you there. One of the keynote speakers at the MASC conference uh, was Bob Taggett. I'm pretty sure I have the name right. Um, he was, the whole, his whole presentation was about um, teaching, we're teaching 20th century skills in the, 20, in the 21st century right. and how, you know, how many people have cell phones in this room and everybody's holding up their cell phones and, you know, they're saying, the, our teachers are saying you have to put the cell phones away, you have to put the technology away, mm -hmm. and we're not teaching towards the future. We're, we're teaching the past, and so it's interesting that this has come up. Right. Um, it looks very good. Yeah. And technology has really changed the career path, and, and it really has changed um, what, what, is, what are out there for opportunities, and, 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 and so, um, you know, the, the mindset, and I, and I think that slowly but surely we're getting away from this whole thing being a bad thing um, and, and, and really understanding that technology, and we had this very conversation today in our admin meeting about taking a look at, we're now three or four years into our one-to-one -one here at the high school and a little bit longer, I think, at the middle school, and taking a look at the technology and are, are we getting what we thought we were going to get out of it and um, more importantly, how are you using it and how do we pair up our faculty with other faculty members to be the trainers on how to use tech? So in other words, if, if you don't use Google Classroom, it might be beneficial to spend a few hours in, in professional development with someone who uses Google Classroom all the time so that maybe you can see the benefits of the technology. Um, I mean, the same thing happened when they invented these things called computers and everybody said that, you know, they'll never last, just like the television will never last either. So they were, they were completely wrong. But anyways, um, it's, it's a slow cultural shift and you need to start somewhere and I think that we're all on board with the idea of making that type of a shift and we do have plenty of teachers in our buildings who are making that shift as well. Um, but we, uh, we need to focus more on it. I th and I think that this is a conversation more for another time, but um, in the middle school where we, we've we come to not have the iPads coming home every day and partially so that we can make them last longer, and I know that part of the goal, Mr. Delaney, was a little bit more of the pencil to paper and, and getting back into those basics. I'm curious... Now, um, you know, I'd be curious to see at the end of the year what your thoughts are. If you know, as a as a one year experiment, if you think that you know it was the right route to take, or if maybe we, they sh the kids should be still coming home and utilizing the iPads at home for their work as well. You know, there's yeah, absolutely. I you know I don't want to put you on the spot, but it's just some a conversation to be had. <laughs> Uh, no, ha happy to report in because it's, it's very important. Um, again, I, and I come to you as somebody who was a, a major early adopter, proponent, sold um, two schools on going on a one-to-one, -one, um, and Douglas Middle School being the third. Again, um, the decision to every, we still have a one-to-one -one iPad capability at the middle school. Um, the not sending them home was multifaceted. One, as you mentioned, was resource preservation. 
they're breaking at an alarming rate and we can't replace them because we don't have the money, one. Two, students are highly distracted with technology in front of them. And um, we have the ability, we, 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 we have to have the ability to engage them and facilitate learning where they are, right? And being able to control content. Um, students have open access and free access to the internet and their own devices, we lose that control. And I welcome you to come into a classroom. Uh, you see it at home, you know, uh, parents have that, that feeling, geez, I'm not exactly sure what they're, they're watching because we don't and it causes us unease. And guess what? When kids uh, don't have any limits, they, they like to see where the edges are, all right? And that's, and that's a reality. Um, so it was resource management. It was um, allowing them to focus a little better in an academic environment. There is still an absolute need for technology integration in every classroom in the middle school. It is still available to every student in the classroom. Um, the facts are, and I'll let the cat out of the bag now, and this is part of our, our presentation on, on the 20th, our scores have gone down as a district, right? Now, do we make the correlation that technology has made the score, scores gone, gone down? No, it, it, that's a huge, it, there's too many other factors. But we are, as Mr. Main said, taking a deep dive into where are we four or five years later um, are we getting a bang for the buck? Are we, do we have the right resources to get maximum efficiency and efficacy out of this opportunity? In middle school, we don't have technology class. We don't have a technology learning specialist. We don't have the maker spaces. So the, the things that a 21st century uh, technology and learning environment are called for and required and are seen as best practice, we can't fund. So we can give the machine to the, the child, but we have to teach them how to best use that machine. And we, quite frankly, at this moment, don't have the resources to adequately use it to its, its maximum efficiency. So we're doing what we can, and part of that was bringing them home, maintaining the resource, getting them back to some basics, <coughs> and, and doing what we can with what we have. So, um, you know, if, if it's, a, if it's a, a, a major blowout mistake, I'll be the first to, to say that was on me. Thus far, our discipline issues around inappropriate technology use are way down. Mm. Our um, technology breakage and replacement is way down. Um, again, I'd be happy on the 20th to, to report what numbers we have compared to last year, but anecdotally and, and quantifiably, you know, we're, it, um, and the, the teachers like it too. So. Um, that, that's where we are, okay. and, and just, uh, you know, all, but all fair conversation is something that Mrs. Sousa is, uh, is very interested in, you know, how are we doing, how could we be doing it better, mm -hmm. where are we failing, where are we succeeding, so. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, Mr. Delaney touches on something that we talked about just recently at, at, at school committee was the whole idea of the move towards um, technology being part of a curriculum that really begins in K and goes all the way to grade 12. And one of, the, one of the major components of that is having a teacher to teach them how to properly use mm -hmm. um, a computer. The same way you had a teacher in front of you that says stay on the home row, keep your, heads up, on, keep your head up in the whole nine yards. Um, we need that, that's something that we need. And we, we've talked about it and there's a, the, the state, the DESE has issued a, um, a long range plan and they've, they've, they've issued some curriculum guides that we can use. Um, it's something that we talked about recently. We definitely, as a district, need to go to. We need to have specialists. We need to have teachers in front of students and we then so that they can get the most out of technology. But another piece that is extremely important is the professional development that we need to have for teachers so they can, so they can maximize the productivity of those um, of those app, the devices. Um, some of the best professional development we ever had was, I don't remember when that was, Cindy, remember when we had the Google Classroom in here? Was that three years ago, maybe four years ago? Yeah, and we had a, quite a number of teachers in here who had never been on a Google Classroom, never had a, you know, a, 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 um, a, an Acer laptop that they were using, and by the time the second day was over, 
we had so many converts into Google Classroom and now they're converting others into Google Classroom and how it works. We have the online textbooks and, and, I, and they are, you know, one of the things is it, it keeps the student at the high school, for example, they bring home their, their Chromebook, they're not bringing home that book that's that big and there's five of them that they used to put in their backpacks. It was, you know, they couldn't, they couldn't get up and down the stairs. Um, so it is, it is a piece of what we do, but part of it is making sure that A, we have a program in place that will support it, and B, that we are, uh, our teachers are well prepared to use it as, as effective as possible. And I can't tell you how many times I've sat here and done this and said, how do, what, do I, what do I do next? And the kid can go, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that doesn't look for the, good for the teacher because right. then the kid thinks the right. teacher right. doesn't know anything. Right. So, and, 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 and they, they've, so they're not afraid of it. Um, it is, when we're not, we're not putting them away and the computer is not going away and, and it's all part of what's going on. I'm glad that we're doing the one-to-one. -one. I think it's productive, I think it's useful. Uh, I think having the technology in the classroom is, is certainly a great thing. I mean, people were fighting to get into a computer lab in this place. Cindy's room was right across the hall from it. And there'd be, there'd be fist fights out in the hallway because I, I booked it, no, I booked it, no, I booked it. Well, that's, that's not an issue any longer. Um, so it really has paid off some serious dividends. However, I think that Donna touched on a very important point. Donna Susan touched on a very important point where we really need to take a step back and look at, okay, we've done this for a number of years. What's good? What's not going as well as it could be? And, and, and you know, is, the, is the, um, the iPad the right way to go or is it going back to what we're doing now at the high school, which is, um, I, I don't know what company we're using now. We were using Acer before. I'm not sure who we're using now. Dell. Chromebooks, that, what is it? Dell. Dell. Dell now. So, um, so you know, and, and, and how is it being used? And um, when we first brought them into the high school, there were some problems with them, and slowly but surely they went away. When we first said to the kids, you can carry these around if you want to, there were some problems, and now, for the most part, there's not much of an issue with the kids having their cell phones with them. Um, so, I mean, we're, we're making strides, but it's, it, this will be a barrier that we will have to, we will have to collectively look at and, and, and get over at some point. But thank you. That was everything I had also. <laughs> Except I didn't know whether or not the Santa company also delivered coal. Mm -hmm. uh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I've been waiting oh. for I, 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 I didn't get in at first. I really wanted to get in right away and I missed it. You've heard it all, I can assure you. <laughs> I just want to make sure that our, 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 our viewing audience heard it as well. Poor guy. This is you again. Um, the FY 2018 transfers and reclassifications. Um, do the transfers first. The first two on the listing came from administrators. The next um, five were just moving within um, school committee and superintendent um, training only because of the different object codes that the um, finance director, town accountant, likes to use. We oftentimes have to move those around. And um, then I'm covering $50 in memberships, and um, the last one is covering the long-term sub that Mr. Maines referred to earlier at the elementary school, and that's coming out of the line um, of funds left from that retirement that I am transferring over there. Does anyone have any questions? I make a motion that we accept the school committee uh, meeting minutes, I'm sorry, the <laughs> school committee meeting, December 6, 2017, FY two th uh, 2018, transfer request number seven. Second. Sorry, I read it backwards. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Very good. Okay, thank you. And then I just have one reclassification. Um, that's just moving um, a membership out of the high school, I mean the um, elementary school principals do as a membership account. It was um, incorrectly coded and it should have gone into the um, district-wide um, student services dues and membership. So just moving that, doing reclassification for that. And I move that we accept the fiscal year 2018 reclassification number four for the school committee meeting of December 6. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, thank you. And that's all I have this evening. Oh, no, I don't. That is all I have this evening. <laughs> okay, next on the agenda.
the FY 2019, believe it or not, um, budget calendar summary. So this is just a synopsis. Um, this will be changed, I'm sure, as we go along. Um, I did last Monday send out budget forms to administrators. They're all preparing their budget. And they'll be um, submitting it to me on Monday, January 8th, for me to begin um, filling in the superintendent's uh, preliminary proposed budget that he will bring to the school committee at some point in February. Um, we will be having a subcommittee meeting, a budget subcommittee meeting tomorrow morning at 9.15 just to discuss priorities and um, other information having to do with the FY19 budget process. And um, if you look at the dates, if, uh, January 19th, 22nd, 29th, um, there might be some movement with those dates there, but we are hoping to have the um, budget complete and for administrators to review on January 19th, the draft. And on the 22nd, um, we'll start meeting. Um, Mr. Maines and I will meet with the administrators, go over all of their budgets. And then um, we will uh, hopefully have the budget finalized to present to the school committee on January 29th and we will be presenting it at the school committee meeting on February 7th. So hoping um, that will be the day. And uh, the next day, if we do do that, we would send it immediately over to the town finance director, town accountant, and the town administrator. And then the last three dates, um, <clears throat> particularly the February 9th through March 26th, um, as you know, we, we will receive at some point in February um, an appropriation amount from the uh, town administrator, finance director, town accountant, for the school department based on their very preliminary numbers. As you know, the cherry sheet would not have, they wouldn't have any final cherry sheet numbers and it's, it is very preliminary. But it gives us some idea of what, if any, we're hoping not, but what, if any, we would need to reduce our preliminary budget by to bring it to that appropriation amount. Um, also, we don't know at this time what, when the finance committee meetings and hearing dates will be. That'll be somewhere in that time frame, time frame as well. Um, and we do, based on the calendar that we have had for the past at least five to eight years, um, we do expect to have our budget hearing on April 4th, and then the annual town meeting will be on Monday, May 7th. Um, there is some wiggle room in there basically between January and through Feb mid-February as far as the pre pre preliminary work and when we get the appro appropriation figure. Jeez, talking too fast maybe. Um, from the town. So that's really the big thing is what that appropriation figure is going to be, as you know. Um, that's, that's really where the, uh, the crux of the issue is. Have any of the town processes changed based on the new administrator, town administrator? I can't imagine Gene would let the budget process change too much, but I, I don't know if it's Oh, no, we haven't heard anything. It really wouldn't change any for us. Yeah. Um, as you know, under Mass General Law, there's a certain time frame that backs up from the town meeting when we must turn it over to the town. And as you also know, from the town standpoint, it's a bottom line appropriation amount. Yeah. So more of it's our process over here as far as, um, and part of the, one of the biggest problems for me is that we have three contracts that haven't been finalized yet. Um, so that affects both 18 and FY19. Um, you know, there's a possibility maybe soon they will be. Um, that does affect the budget preparation as well. So. Um, but I'll certainly update, update this as we go along for any changes, particularly in the January through February time frame. And then I'll update it to let you know when the Finance Committee meetings and hearing dates will be as well. So we're just starting the process. And, uh, and our goal is obviously, as we, uh, Courtney has said a number of times, is to maintain our, s our staffing and maintain our programs to the best of our ability. That's, mm -hmm. that's our goal. Yep. Very good. Anything else before we adjourn? We do have executive session this evening. Yep. So um, we have executive session to discuss, discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation an open meeting would have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigation position of the governmental body and to conduct collective bargaining. Um, when executive session is concluded, public session will be adjourned and there will be no further public business conducted. And I do invite Mr. Means and Ms. Keegan to join us this evening. So it is now... 820 is not right. Is that right? 820. No, that's not right. 819. Thank you. Um, thanks for coming, everybody. Good night. Roll call vote. Oh, roll call vote. Yes. Yes. Finning and I. Julie Mulder. I.
Brett Argel, aye. Sherry Zetlin, aye. 